want to talk to you about, oh, by the way, I'm the tiny house foodie. This is my little project that I've been working on for some time. And I want to talk to you about pain, pie, poverty, and purpose. Those are the four things I want to talk to you about, okay? So the pain. Uh, Xavier and I have both been married for 20 years to other people who didn't like us. <laughs> Anybody been there? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so we found each other. I'll be careful. Sorry about that. We found each other a little late in life. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. I'm almost 50. Whoops, I did. And uh, he's a pipe organ builder, and that is the coolest thing. <laughs> we owned a restaurant that was 3,000 square feet. He was busy taking care of pipe organs. I was busy doing the whole restaurant ownership thing. And let me tell you, that is work. <laughs> And here we are, we've found each other late in life, and we have a, finally have a spouse that likes us, and we are working these insane hours, and we don't get to see each other. We'd have this, like this storybook romance, we would get in a vintage car, and we would point it anywhere, and we would drive, and we would stop when we wanted to, picnic when we wanted to, and stay where we wanted to, and it was a storybook romance. And did I mention he's nice? He's kind to me? <laughs> I thought maybe I could just take my time getting used to that. <laughs> so we had this amazing romance, and then here we are back at work. I'm running a restaurant, he's building pipe organs, and we are not getting to see each other. And so we made this kind of revolutionary choice in the face of the pain of not seeing the man who is my true mate, we sold the restaurant to a guy who's not really good. Beside the point. No. no, actually he's an amazing chef. It's just a really expensive. I need to stop. <laughs> you just stop. You're all family, right? <laughs> So anyway, we went from a 3,000 square foot restaurant into a home. Guess how big my house was? Anybody know? Some of you know. 125 square feet. What? Yeah, that's what I said. What? Okay, so we're mortgage free. I can drive my house down Main Street. I love it. It's adorable. I love my life. And then it's fall. And in the fall, I want apple pie, not Marie Callender's apple pie, I want my apple pie. I have a recipe for apple pie that it took me quite some time to perfect. It's Yummy. the way I want apple pie. <laughs> it's also crazy complicated, it takes a lot of pots, and an oven, did I mention it takes an oven? Okay, so our tiny house had an oven that didn't really work, and then it had a toaster oven, and you're not gonna bake a pie for an hour in a toaster oven. So. I got depressed. I wanted pie. It's a simple thing to ask to be able to bake your favorite food once a year. <laughs> so, you've heard my pain. I didn't get to see the man that I love more than anything. My pie was the problem because I wanted pie and I couldn't have it. And I started to feel like I was poor. You know, when the world looks at tiny house people, and people who own just a few things. We have a word for that. What is the word for that? Poverty. We have a word for people who don't own much stuff. And the word is poverty. And see, I had to learn the hard way that we had chosen this life. It wasn't poverty, it was purpose. We had chosen this life on purpose. And we came to the hard way, did I mention it was the hard way? We came to this tiny house minimalism, where you take the things that don't really matter, like housing, and instead of spending three quarters or 75% of every week hours, and the income you get from those hours, instead of spending all of that on housing, <laughs> We minimized it for this little bitty house, mortgage free, and suddenly what opened up was so unexpected. 
instead of spending all of that time and all of that heart and all of that soul energy on a house that you live in and that you sleep in and that you store your clothes and your shoes in, we squished that part and it made room for purpose. And then something happened. We were invited to host a meal, so we did. Guess what the menu was? Everything I was hungry for. I made chicken soup from scratch. You know, the, the, the process that takes a day or two, I made chicken soup from scratch because it was what I was hungry for. I mean, it was nice to serve those people chicken soup, but come on. <laughs> and Xavier baked the bread, and of course it was phenomenal. Guess what we had for dessert? What? Yes. And was it good? Good. See, we tend to think our kitchen needs to have every piece of equipment you would need for everything you want to make once a week, twice a month, once a year. I make that pie once a year. Come on, it's too much work. And, you know, there's only one time a year that I really crave apple pie. So I need to have a kitchen that can make an apple pie that I can make every year once? Okay. <laughs> Let's think about that for a minute. So you know what? When you really, when there's something you really want, and you live in a tiny house, you can't, you literally can't make it. Guess what you do? Hi, dear friend. I'm wondering if I could come to your house and make apple pie. And by the way, I'm going to leave one for you. Who will say no to that? Would you say no to that if I came to your house and said I want to make the best apple pie I've ever had? And I'm going to leave you one? Of course you're not going to say no. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> you're right. I'll, I'll do my own dishes or ask my handsome gentleman over there. Um, so, if you have the pain of struggling on the gerbil wheel to make that house work, keep the mortgage paid so they don't come and take it back from you, you know, you have this expense in your life, not necessarily financial, but the expense of your hours and of your work and feeling trapped in a situation that's not going to change. And that sucks the hope right out of you. And it makes you restless and it makes you grumpy and all of those things. <laughs> so we traded it all in. And then we came up against the obstacle of pie. It's okay. We figured out the pie thing. You get creative. You talk to your friends and you say, can I come make apple pie at your house? And they say, of course. Anything else you want to make next month? <laughs> Cheesecake? You know, come on. Come on back. This is a pretty good gig. So we're working on a schoolie and we've found a little oven that we can actually make the pie in. <laughs> so in case you're interested in or curious, that is the Breville Smart Oven Air. And I'm just, I just gave an ad for a product. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm giving you the pie. I'm giving you the pie. Poverty. When we change our mindset. Thank you, Kenny. Oh, I like this one better. I'm going to turn it up. Okay. I'll give you one. He'll grab it. So, the mindset of poverty. So I can't talk like that. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> poverty is a mindset. Okay, poverty is a real thing. Don't get me wrong. But some of us choose this kind of homelessness, which is foundationless living. That's not the same thing as poverty, okay? We are talking about two different things. But poverty can happen here. We can tell ourselves we're poor when we're not. We can tell ourselves we're poor when we actually are working towards purple. And so it really becomes important when you get into your kitchen and you're trying to make the pie or the whatever it is, fill in the blank, whatever the food is that's too complex to make in your kitchen, you make the change. Poverty is a mindset. And so we have come to call it, see I put all of this process, everything that we learned the hard way went in here. This is not a cookbook by the way. This is about 50% practical, this is how you do it, and it's about the other 50% is like, why you do it or mindset stuff, what it takes here to make it work. So I want to tell you a story. By the way, 
I'm Mennonite, can you tell? <laughs> so when I was a little bitty girl, I heard this sermon. Do you mind if I tell you a sermon that I remember from 40, whoops, from a long time ago? <laughs> <laughs> whoops. So it was this Mennonite campground and us kids would go out and play in the creek and go swimming during the day. And then in the evening, there was this big community meal and somebody would preach. Has anybody ever heard of Myron Augsburger? Okay. If you're a Mennonite, you know who that is. He preached a sermon that kind of, well, first of all, I paid attention. That just doesn't happen when you're 10. <laughs> So he, he was able to keep my attention because he was pretty weird and really wonderful. And I'd never heard anybody preach like he did. So let's see, where do I start? So one night a gentleman named Myron Augsburger preached. He was tall, aristocratic man and a gifted speaker. I may have been about nine years old or so, and somehow the way he spoke kept my full attention. He read us a passage from Deuteronomy about Og. O.G. Og, okay? He was the king of Bashan. The text mentions that Og had an iron bed. In fact, that's all we know about this guy. The air was full of night noises, the fire was burning brightly, and the crowd gathered in close. Pastor Augsburger paced and preached. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, but Og had an iron bed. Moses bought, brought the family of Jacob out of slavery in Egypt and parted the Red Sea so they walked through on dry ground and Og had an iron bed. Gideon led an army of 300 men into battle against the Midianites who brought his community back from the, who brought his community to the brink of starvation. You'd think I'd never read this before. They had so many soldiers that it was impossible to count them all, but Gideon and his small band of warriors won a great victory, and Og had an iron bed. Esther went to her king and explained Haman's plot, plot to kill all the Jews, and her people were saved. Og had an iron bed. Are we seeing a theme here? Pastor Augsburger paced the floor and continued. Now, I'm putting words in his mouth. These are, he didn't say this. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the contents of their character or the contents of your bank account. King spoke that dream aloud and it was a transcendent moment. We heard him and his dream became our dream and it changed the course of a generation. We've made some, that has taken a hit lately, but we'll get back to it. Og had an iron bed. Pastor Augsburger told the stories of the heroes of the faith and contrasted each one of them with Og and his iron bed. Og was the guy who got his name in the pages of a holy book only because of a thing he happened to own. That's it. I was just a kid, but I knew the difference in being known for owning some weird thing as opposed to being known for making a positive difference in the world. I thought about Pastor Augsburger's sermon again recently as I was preparing this manuscript. And my parents invited me to another Mennonite conference. And there was a meal afterwards. <laughs> they sat down next to Byron Augsburger, Myron and Esther Augsburger, and they were just chatting away. And then the people who were across from them moved. Guess what I did? Hi, my name's Carmen, and I remember a sermon you preached 40 years ago. <laughs> And I met that man all over again, <laughs> and I told him, I preached back to him his own words. And he kind of laughed and said, I have been known to preach on some pretty obscure passages. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, people don't preach on materialism anymore. He's, that's right, they don't. Just as quick as that. that that's right, they don't. I think he's so cool. He had a message that stuck with me all this time. You can be known for owning some crazy thing, even something as cool as a tiny house, and still not have a sense of purpose, 
and still live in a sense of poverty. Or can get out there and make your mark. Living tiny is a way to minimize the things that don't really matter so that you can get out there and do the things that do. My name is Carmen Schenk. I am the Tiny House Foodie. I believe in you. If you want to go tiny, you can. I believe you can. It might be tricky in places, but I think my book will help you with the nuts and bolts of it. Thank you so much. You've been great.